and she disappeared. Here's a picture of her holding the antenna, and that's the, the antenna. Over 40,000 years until miners discovered it about two years ago, and we purchased it from them. Still has the bayonet with it. From mammoth tusks and ivory, that is a huge, huge tooth. Process them and price them and put them out. So, can you show them, show them what, uh, what you're working on? Yeah, just show them what you do. That was just bought, that is gonna go out today. So, natural life in giant arboretums down in Peru. Every evening, the local villagers. Hey guys, this is John with the Appalachian Channel. I'm here with Chase Pops. He's the owner of the Relic Room, and this place is absolutely amazing. When you're, it's the largest collection of historical memorabilia for sale in the world. And we're gonna go behind the scenes. You're not just gonna get to see what's in the store that's amazing. We're gonna go behind the scenes and show you how he processes the, the memorabilia that comes in, how they package it, and put it on the shelf and ship it and sell it different ways. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing here. So we're, in any way that you can be involved in history, we are involved in history. From discovering history, to researching history, to restoring history, to buying and selling history. If it's in history, we're on top of it. And all periods of history, from geologic history, all the way up through the dinosaurs, to human history as well. This is the largest diversity of history for sale anywhere in North America. We're inside of Smoky Mountain Knife Works, right next to the waterfall and we've got a lot of cool stuff to show you guys yes we're going to be moving really fast and i know people they're like why didn't you slow down if we slowed down we'd be here for days so if you want to see it all <laughs> really close up you're going to have to come here and visit this is one of the most visited stores in Severeville. yeah there over two million two million people a year come here it's like a museum and what was you saying about it? you didn't care if people buy it or not no the thing with this us is is that there's stuff really cool stuff to look at all over the walls all over in the showcases i don't care if you come in and buy anything or not i really don't i don't what i care about is is that you get to see some really cool stuff so this is like a museum that you can buy from if you want to so you can go check out the cool things in the museum and if you want to take it home you can take it home so just look right here check this out guys yeah oh yeah this is super neat tell us about this chase so what this is is this is a woolly mammoth leg that was discovered about two years ago in Siberia in Russia. What's fascinating about this piece is you see these pieces here? That is the original muscle tissue that is still attached to the mammoth. So this is literally mammoth meat is what this is. So this was uh, locked in permanently frozen ground for over 40,000 years until miners discovered it about two years ago and we purchased it from them. So this is something that very few museums in the world have that you can come and you can actually see and check out. And uh, when we bought it, we actually, uh, me and three buddies actually tried a piece of it just what to see. Try piece? Oh, we ate some. Oh yeah. no. Oh yeah. You Do you want to try some? <laughs> no, I'm good. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> but we now know what mammoth tastes like and it does not, it doesn't taste good. I can't imagine if it's 40,000 years old. No, it, it tastes like dirt. Well, we're going to walk around in the retail part and he's going to show us some of the different sections because each showcase has a different section. And I guess we'll start right here. Uh, yeah, let's go right, right here and tell us about these and how you package these and why you do what you do with them. So I'll show you guys in the behind the scenes later on in this episode. But so what we do is, is we actually go out in the field and we discover a lot of this history ourselves. And what we don't discover ourselves, we are working directly with the men and women who are in the field discovering their history. You see, there are groups of people that that is what they do for a living, is they do nothing but get up, put their boots on, and go dig for dinosaur fossils. Or there are people that get up, put their boots on, and go metal detect for artifacts. And so we work directly with each of these communities to buy quantities of stuff and to put them in these really neat frames and have them at a price that you can afford. That's what's so important is, is that in the grand scheme of things, fossils really aren't rare. Artifacts really aren't rare. What's rare is people out there finding them. And so what we do is, is we work with these people, put them together in frames uh, that's got a whole story and everything that tells everything about it, where it was found, what the species name is, everything. And like you can get this piece of an extinct taper for 15 bucks, or you can get a really nice piece a dinosaur bone that's a rib section uh, for 20 bucks this is a triceratops part of a triceratops that's a frill piece that you can get for 20 bucks or 
piece of mammoth ivory here. Just all kinds of different things, but not only fossils. Come here, I'll show you some other stuff that we do. We also do this with meteorites. There are different meteorites that we do, and there are people that that's what they do for a living, is they get up and they go hunt meteorites for a living, or artifacts even, like this Civil War bullet, so or this Colt pistol bullet. And so what we do is, is we'll buy, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100 of those, and we'll put them in these educational displays where people can check them out and they can see it. So when you come in, you're going to get a really cool artifact with all of its information that basically tells everything about that artifact. That is just one of the things that we do. The really cool thing is, is our display cases that are in the show, and we cover the entirety of history. For example, this is all medical history right here. This entire showcase is nothing but medical artifacts. And we've got over 50 displays that are broken down into sections like this, from shipwreck history to antique firearms to military history, and we'll show you guys all of these. But I'll show you something really cool in this display case. We just picked this up this week. This is a box that still has the original medicine in it. So when a pharmacist would buy his supplies of medicine to make pills or whatever he was making. He would buy them in groups like this that would all be different different medicines. And what's fascinating about this is, is this still has the original medicine inside it. So, and this is something that we just picked up. It came out of Louisville, Kentucky. And, you know, this is something that, you know, was locked up in, uh, in this, he, this guy was a pharmacist, and it was up in his attic and just one that he kept. See, the thing is, is artifacts like this are, you know, they're, they're still around. You know, humanity has been making stuff for a really long time. And a lot of this stuff that people made, even in the past, is still out there to find. And there are communities of people that that's all they do is nerd out on finding that history. We are one of them. This is another really cool thing. This is what's called a flame, and I'll take this out of the showcase and show you what it is. So, a flame is a device that is used to bleed you. It's from the from the process known as desanguination. What they would do is, is they believed back during the Civil War and Revolutionary War and going all the way back to medieval times that your body had four humors in it. They had blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, and urine, and what you would do is, is your body was in balance of one of those, so they would, a doctor would cut you and bleed you for a little bit. George Washington died because he was bled to death. But this is a medical tool, a medical device from about the time of the 1840s, 30s, uh, for that, that process of bleeding, which is crazy to think of. So that's a neat piece. So this is all medical artifacts here. Everything from old bottles to tools used to pull teeth. <clears throat> the next group we've got is antique firearms. So these are all antique firearms. These are all pre-1898. Um, you know, things that have either been dug by metal detectorists or kept and traded around in collections for years and years from, from flintlock rifles up top to Civil War era muskets to handguns. This is a really cool piece right here. This is a 18th century, late 18th century European blunderbuss. So this is the gun that Elmer Fudd would carry right here. But what's neat about this piece is that it still has, back up the camera a little bit and we'll show them, still has the bayonet with it and it's still in good working order. Is that not cool? So this is just a really unique antique firearm. So one of the many cool antique guns that we have here at the Relic Room. So the next group of stuff to show you guys is another one of my favorites. Well, we've got antique bottles here, is uh, artifacts from the Revolutionary War. So this is all artifacts from the late 18th, early 19th century. A lot of this stuff is everything from coins to horn cups to powder horns to uh, old accoutrements, pouches, drums, uh, antique Bibles, but you know, people like to collect artifacts from, you know, America's War of Independence. And so, you know, we go out and we, we look for that stuff and, and we have it all here. Like, this is really cool. This is, a, this is a liquor cabinet from the Napoleonic War era. This is an officer's liquor cabinet and it still has the liquor in it, which is really, really cool. 
old trunks. These are uh, antique Bibles. But the thing is, is that, you know, okay, everybody in the Revolutionary War had a Bible. Well, just about. Most everybody did. Well, there were a lot of people that lived during that time, and so their stuff is somewhere. And so it's just in, either in people's attics or lost in a home or in somebody's collection. And so what we do is we gather this stuff up and we have it for sale where people can, can take it, take care of it. So Revolutionary War. Ephemera. This is documents and, and trunks and pocket watches. People, old antique books. People like to collect this stuff. Like this is a first edition of Mark Twain's book, A Tramp Abroad. If you've never read any Mark Twain, Mark Twain was the... Uh, was uh, early an American humorist, basically the first great American comedian. He was awesome. Really recommend reading it. Two antique documents. People like to collect, you know, documents from the Civil War or from the Revolutionary War. You know, all those people had documents back then. All those documents are somewhere. So, like, here's a book. These are all Union documents from the Civil War from 1863. And, you know, you can pick some of these documents up for $35. It's a union document from the Civil War. If possible, we do research uh, to try to tell what that is all about. Here's one that was written about a soldier, and this is all the history that we could find on it. Uh, here are some more documents from the late 19th century. So this is all post-Civil War documents and paper. And if we know, like, here's a guy, here's a guy's picture, here's the write-up on who this person was, and it's 40 bucks. So we try to put as much information as we can, as we can with it. And in the back, in the behind the scenes at the end, I'll show you guys a little bit more about the research that we do. But like here, these are almanacs, farmer's almanacs, 1839, 1842, 1840, 1834, you know, for 20, 25 bucks. So just old farmer's almanacs. And people enjoy collecting that stuff. Another genre of stuff that we have, we'll stick with human history first and then we'll go to fossil history, then we'll go to crystal and mineral history. So is World War II stuff, artifacts from, from World War II, from helmets to, <clears throat> these are American and German artifacts including parts of V2 rockets. So I've got friends of mine that metal detect uh, in England and they metal detect old V2 sites uh, where V2s crashed in. There were something like 4,000 V2s that hit England. And so that's how we'll get pieces of V2 rockets. Japanese World War II memorabilia from sake cups to canteens, all kinds of neat stuff. This is super cool. So this is the exact same radio system that was used by Amelia Earhart when she disappeared. Here's a picture of her holding the antenna and that's the, the antenna. This was the first communication, this was the most high-tech communication uh, device that was used by aircraft in the late 1930s, and we've got one right there. This went down, wherever Amelia Earhart's plane is, this is inside it, this exact same radio system. Is that not cool? Another history that we have is prehistoric Native American history. Uh, a lot of people collect uh, uh, arrowheads and celts and axes on farmers' fields and stuff like that. So, you know, we, we have a lot of that. We've also got other Stone Age era artifacts, but from all over the world and all periods of history. These up here on the top, surely you guys have heard of Neanderthals or Homo erectus or Homo habilis. What those are, are those are different species of human beings that are now extinct. So our species, Homo sapiens sapien, is a species. Homo neanderthalus is another species. And these are the tools that, we made, that they made. So these are tools made by species of humans that are now extinct. Down here we've got more arrowheads and Neolithic stone tools from Europe and Africa, grinding stones just from different parts of the world because, you know, just like we have arrowheads here in the States, they had arrowheads in Europe, they had arrowheads in Africa because it's all from a period known as the Stone Age where humanity didn't know how to make tools out of metal, but they did out of stone and those stones are still out. Another group is early Christian artifacts. These are all Christian artifacts from uh, uh, all over the world from antique Bibles to coins and stuff. Uh, back over here we have got artifacts from the Celtic, Egyptian, Roman, and Viking eras. So we work with people in Europe that metal detect for that stuff legally. That's another important thing that we really work hard on is make sure that we're following all federal, uh, national, and international laws on the collection of antiquities. 
So none of the stuff that we have is really terribly expensive. You know, it's just all neat stuff. More military artifacts here. Civil War artifacts here. More Civil War era artifacts, more World War II. Now, I wanna show you guys the fossils. So our fossil collection starts with the oldest fossil known on the planet, or at least it was until about a year ago. So this is a fossil of a uh, microbial mat, basically the single cell bacteria in which all life comes from. This fossil is 3.49 billion years old, and that piece right there, that is the actual fossil of that microbial mat. It's from a really famous site that a lot of documentation has been done on. It's called North Pole Dome in Western Australia. Um, these are trilobites. I'm sure everybody's heard of little, little trilobites. So these are trilobite fossils. They lived there in the Devonian period over 400 million years ago. So we go from trilobites to stuff that goes back a couple million to billion years to ammonites. These are all marine cephalopods. Uh, this is amylite. This is a particular type of ammonite that comes from a specific spot in uh, southwestern Alberta in Canada. Uh, more ammonites. So ammonites, is, this is a really cool, this is a really cool piece. So this is an ammonite. So here's what the ammonite looks like when it's together. All right, these come out of Madagascar. This is the fossil, this is a fossil of a shell. And what my buddy does that digs this stuff is, is he splits it down the middle and opens it up where you can see the chambers inside of it. All these little chambers were filled with gas that allowed this animal to bob in the, in the ocean uh, as it lived 100 million years ago. So that's a really neat, really neat cool type of fossil. Next, we've got fossils from early mammals. So after the dinosaurs went extinct, the first life that rose up were, was us, mammals, and these are fossils from the Eocene and Oligocene period. Then we have Ice Age fossils. So these are all different fossils from the Ice Age, from cave bear to horse to even woolly mammoth ivory. So woolly mammoths, just like elephants do today, woolly mammoths had tusks, and this is what a woolly mammoth tusk looks like right here that is a piece of, of mammoth tusk and you can see where it's sawn this shows the growth rings of the animals and this animal was about 30 years old when it died so from mammoth tusks and ivory to mammoth bones and other ice age fossils including dire wolf horse giant armadillo the, here's some more mammoth fossils mammoth teeth these are all mammoth teeth another big piece of chunk, mammoth ivory, some larger bones, woolly rhinoceros, cave bear. <clears throat> then we get into megalodon teeth. Megalodon teeth is this whole separate genre. There are people that and friends of ours that that is what they do for a living. They wake up, put on their boots, and they get in the rivers and they dive for this teeth. Now what's so interesting is, is look at all these teeth down here. There's so many of these teeth. How is it possible that a megalodon could have all of these teeth? Well, that's because sharks shed their teeth throughout the entirety of their lifetime. So a shark sheds on average 35,000 teeth within its lifetime. Well, megalodon was so big that it could bite a T-Rex in half, and that is a really big mouth. So you've got one animal that's shedding 30,000 teeth in its lifetime, over 20 million years that it lived, that's a lot of teeth. So megalodon, there, there are a lot of teeth out there and they get up to over six inches long. Here's one that's six inches right there. That is a huge, huge tooth. I mean, that's one tooth and he had a couple hundred. I'd say there wouldn't be very many deep sea divers <laughs> that exist uh, if, if he still lived. These are all dinosaur fossils. So this is one of the things that we really involve ourselves heavily with because we've got two showcases of dinosaur fossils. So we work, not only do we go out in the field and hunt this stuff, but we work with the men and women that go out in the field every day, all day. That is how they make a living to hunt these dinosaur fossils. And we hunt areas in the western United States uh, formations from the Two Medicine to the Hell Creek to the Lance Creek to the Morrison where dinosaur fossils are found. And so these are all pieces of dinosaur fossil. This is a little hadrosaur vertebrae. So this is a plant-eating dinosaur, a little hadrosaur vertebrae. This is one that my son found. This is a partial triceratops vertebrae right there. 
So that's one my son found. And then we've got something like Tyrannosaurus rex teeth. That's a Tyrannosaurus rex tooth. Now what's interesting about dinosaurs is, is that like sharks, dinosaurs shed their teeth throughout the entirety of their lifetime. So there are a lot of dinosaur teeth out there. And I'll show you, here's a hadrosaur jaw that a buddy of ours found. And you can see the tooth columns in this jaw section. So here's the jaw, so you guys can get an idea. This is the lower jaw of a hadrosaur. If you look here, all these columns here, these are all the channels where the teeth would grow and then would spit out. So they think dinosaurs shed about the same amount of teeth. Now to show you another example of it, here is a plate that's in situ. So what in situ means is, is this is the dirt, the matrix that this fossil was found in. And this is a um, phytosaur tooth, phytosaur tooth, phytosaur tooth, phytosaur tooth, phytosaur tooth. There are over 20 something teeth in here and these weren't put in there. This is the rock. There's another tooth there, another partial tooth there, another partial tooth there, another tooth right down there. These are, this is all where it was found at. So when, when we found this spot, there were all of these teeth and instead of breaking all the teeth out individually, we just kept it in the block all together because it made a really neat display. So that just shows you how many uh, fossils there really are out there to find. Another genre is uh, fossil fish. So a lot of people have seen these fossils from Wyoming. Oh, we go out and dig with these guys all the time. So, okay, that's the fossils. Let me take you to the rest of the store and show you the other side. <clears throat> we've been in business for over 40 years. This is all that we've ever done. So this is the other side of the store. We've got a few bit more human history and I'll show you some of the natural history. So this is all shipwreck artifacts here. All shipwreck artifacts. So there are people that that's all they do for a living is dive looking for shipwrecks. And we've got famous shipwrecks from the, uh, from the Atosha to the uh, SS Central America. Uh, gold, silver, um, cannons, firearms, all kinds of just bottles, all kinds of neat artifacts that came off of all these old shipwrecks. These are more shipwreck artifacts here. This is all medieval history right here. So all history from the medieval period from Europe. African-American history. We've got a good collection of African-American artifacts. Uh, photographs, uh, daguerreotypes, amber types, tin types. People like to collect these old photographs. Historic Native American history. These are artifacts from Africa. All artifacts from tribal Africa. These are artifacts from China and Japan, including some samurai artifacts here from swords to helmets. Those are actual samurai helmets. And that's a neat piece. That's actually a stirrup, a samurai era stirrup. These are artifacts from, um, uh, from uh, uh, the Buddhist culture, so antique Buddhists like Thailand, Indonesia. These are all Islamic era artifacts from the Arab world. Then these are artifacts from uh, the South Pacific, so Papua New Guinea, Philippines, uh, all the islands in the South Pacific, all those tribal groups, these are all artifacts from, from their era. But it's not just stuff here on land. We've got some stuff from outer space as well, and I'll show you guys those right here. In this showcase are meteorites. So these are all meteorites, every single one of them. And we've got uh, about 30 different meteorite falls. Now, how do you tell what rock is a meteorite and what isn't? Well, these rocks have been chemically tested and they, they uh, have a very specific chemical signature. So all of these get tested uh, to where the chemical signature matches that of a meteorite. Plus, they're also found in strewn fields. So they're, they're kind of all found in the same area. And there are people that make a living every day, all day, doing nothing but metal detecting and hunting for meteorites. So here's a really cool one. This is one of the more common meteorites. And you can see this right here. That's called the fusion crust. That only happens to a rock when it enters into the Earth's atmosphere and heats up to a high temperature. Uh, we have also have lunar meteorites and Martian meteorites. So these are Mars rocks and moon rocks here. So. How do they know that this came from Mars and this came from the moon? Well, because we have been to Mars, because we've been to the moon, we know the chemical signatures of the rocks that came from there. And so what happened is, as you look at the moon, it's filled with all kinds of crazy pockmarks where it's been hit by asteroids and meteorites. When a meteorite 
hits the moon and it knocks off stuff into space, that floats around in space as, a, as an object. When it falls into Earth's atmosphere as a meteorite, it becomes a lunar meteorite. And so that is where Mars rocks and moon rocks come from. There are other really cool types like this palisade here. This is Shim Sham. So this is what you're seeing is, is you're seeing a piece of a meteorite, a big chunk like this down here that has been cut, has been cut and polished and dipped in acid so you can see the crystalline structure of the meteorite and what's interesting is it has gemstones in it so while this was floating in space it collided with another object and that collision combined the iron and the gem mineral as well it's a really cool type of type of meteorite so probably one of our biggest um, things that we have our largest selection are the crystals and minerals and we have got over 350 different crystals and minerals that you can choose from, that you can hang out. People like cre collecting crystals and minerals just for themselves. Other people use them for their metaphysical properties. We kind of gear towards the metaphysical use of crystals and minerals. And what that is, is, is in a nutshell, basically each crystal, each rock, each different type ha vibrates. And that vibrates at a specific frequency. Everything in the universe vibrates. I vibrate, you vibrate the pin vibrates, everything vibrates, and you can measure that vibration. And so these vibrations, these different frequencies, are known to help human beings with different things. So whether it be, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you've got depression or you're having a bad day or whatever, there all these different things do, do different stuff. So these are all the different crystals and minerals that we have, including some really cool specimens here and here. And this is a beautiful crystal quartz crystal point with some gorgeous inclusions in it there's some really pretty inclusions in there so what that is is that's a crystal that grew and then it had all these little inclusions and stuff in it so like i said over 350 different crystals and minerals to choose from and each one is written out with a different metaphysical property of each as far as we can tell we've got the largest selection of different crystals and minerals anywhere in the southeast uh, we've got a lot of antique books that you can pick up um, and stands and antique bottles more crystals and minerals I'll show you one more thing and then I'm going to take you into the back and show you the bowels of the relic room and how we do all that we do <clears throat> one last thing that we've got is we've got these gorgeous butterfly collections here so these butterflies are in arboretums. They live a natural life in giant arboretums down in Peru. Every evening, the local villagers walk the arboretum floors collecting all the butterflies that died of natural causes. And they take these butterflies, they remove the bodies and the wings, and they place them in these beautifully uh, made displays. Another neat thing are the oddities here. People like collecting macabre stuff, odd stuff like, you know, crocodile skulls or boar skulls or, you know, different body parts and pieces. That's kind of a neat thing that people started collecting. And even uh, coins and currency. Coins and currency is a really big thing to collect. So we have a lot of old and ancient coins, uh, everything from uh, English silver crowns and shillings going back to the you know, the time of Elizabeth I up to um, Morgan silver dollars, Liberty half dollars, all that cool stuff. This is super cool. We've also got these larger specimens here and we've got these specimens in all different shapes and sizes, but this is a giant amethyst cathedral. Now what this is, is, is this is a hollow cavity that was discovered. Basically a, a big ball of gas that was deep underneath the earth. As the millions of years went on, minerals from the ground would seep into that hollow cavity and would grow these crystals. People would come along, find these crystal geodes, cut them in half, and create a base for them where they can stand up and be displayed. But that's, how, that's how geodes are found and discovered. And these come from friends of ours down in Brazil uh, who do nothing but mine it for a living. Yeah, this is a really big set. People like to come and, and get their get their picture with it like they're angels so people like people like checking that out this is a cool piece here this is a giant uh, duckbill dinosaur arm a hadrosaur arm this is what was all found all together uh, articulated so that means this all these bones were found together and every bone of this was found with this except for this one this was the only bone that was missing but this is in a sense a dinosaur arm 
So we talked about why that bone was missing earlier. Kind of explain why a bone would be yeah, missing. Yeah. So what happens is, is when fossils are found. Um, so sometimes fossils are found just by themselves. So when you're out walking through the woods and you see a deer skeleton, well, the whole skeleton's not there. Usually, it's carried off by predators or scavengers or whatever, and only part of it's there. So that, that same process happened in the Cretaceous period with the dinosaurs as well, just like it happens today. And so a flood would come around or something and, and the, the, what was left of that animal would get washed into a river where it would then get buried in an oxygen-free environment. The only way fossils get to us is if they are in an oxygen-free environment. And the best chances for that is, is being buried in a riverbed. A lot of times when we're hunting for this stuff, that's what we're looking for is we're looking for these ancient riverbeds. And so this is an arm that got washed into a riverbed and floated up while it still had some meat on it, which is why it was articulated. And then it was discovered millions of years later by, uh, by friends of ours. So now I want to show you guys the back. This is the part of the shop in our operation that most people don't get to see. We've got a cannon here defending the relic room <coughs> in case of attack. <coughs> so this is the back. We're going to head back to the back of the relic room. A lot of people think that, that's, that all that we do is buy and sell stuff. Well, that's not all what we're about. So a lot of times we're about the actual research. So this is one of our stock areas. So we've got a big stock room back here. Big stock room back here. But a lot of the frames that you see, we do and put those together all ourselves. So I'll take you into our receiving area and show you show you that. <clears throat> so this is the receiving area of the relic room. This is where when we get this is where when we get new crystals and minerals that come to us, this is where we receive on them and work on them. So for example, we've got we just bought out a mineral business out of Arizona. The business, it went out of business and we literally bought their entire warehouse. So what we're doing is, is we're going through these flats and we're gonna process them and price them and put them out. So, you know, the, you can see that's their prices that were on them here, their prices on them. So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna cut these prices in half and that's the retail that you will pay. So it, we bought it at a great price where we can really offer it for, for a really good, good price to people. Here's some more crystals. Now this is called Vivianite. This is a really beautiful stone that was only discovered about, um, about 15 years ago in the Amazon uh, jungle. And so used to a piece like this would be 40, 50 bucks. Uh, but we were able to get this stuff where we can price it for 10 bucks working directly with the people down there that go out and find that. But what we're doing is, is we're separating it out by price point uh, and type so that it's easy for us to put out on the showroom floor. So like this piece would be 25, 30 bucks. So it's just a beautiful, rare crystal. Um, we got Miss Connie back here working. How's Miss Connie today? Fine. What are you working on? Our second box of <coughs> Megalodon. You are working on some Megalodon teeth. So okay, cool. Over here, so Can you show them, show them what, uh, what you're working on? Show them exactly? Yeah, just show them what you do. So like we said, we do all of this stuff in-house, and Miss Connie is one of our staff that does a great job in putting these frames together. Okay. I have to cut the burlap, which over there, so I have to cut the burlap to make sure they're going to fit in. And I get an empty case like this, and then I put the burlap in. Then I put the mats, which they have to make the mats. And then I put the tooth in, cover it up. I usually have a little for my fingers, and then I just put it in. So what we've got is, is so since we're working directly with the people that are in the field finding this stuff, so I'll go out and I'll buy a thousand Megalodon teeth that'll all work for that size frame. I'll do a write-up on it, I'll give the write-up to another member of our staff who will design it and make up, make and type up the frame. We'll print 
5,000 of these, 5,000 of these, and give Connie the parts and pieces, yeah, and she'll... Yeah, I have a box right here of the teeth that I have to sort first. Yep, here's... I have to find the what's <clears throat> going to go in. There's the teeth, and so she'll pick the ones that'll fit inside the hole, and she will make those up, but we do all of that in-house. All the designing is in-house, all the write-ups are in-house. Here's some mats that are already made up. So this is for a collision in space meteorite, another meteorite frame. This is one for a Spinosaurus tooth. So Connie will make all these up in-house and we make up literally tens of thousands of these a year we make up. So um, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Lisa's gone, but she's been working on some stuff for a grab bag. So we do a lot of grab bag specials. Uh, and when we do that, so we do a, a, not only a lot of grab bags, but a lot of giveaways as well. Um, she's working on uh, Ice Age shell fossils, devil toenails, opal, Brazilian amethyst. So if you visit the area and get a coupon book, uh, usually within those books, there's a little coupon, you know, come visit the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Well, we do, a, you know, if you come visit us, we'll give you something for free, but we'll give you something really cool for free, like this right here. And it's going to come with a little piece of paper with a write-up that tells everything that you want to know about whatever that thing is. And here's kind of some stock on it. So here's one that I was working on earlier. So this is all manganese. <clears throat> so this is all manganese that'll be given away. So you get a really beautiful piece of manganese for free for coming and visiting us if you have that coupon. Here is some big chunks of petrified wood. Uh, we'll do these in our grab bags where for, you know, and our grab bags are for 10 to $20. You get a grab bag that's got, you know, over a dozen things. It's all gonna have information and it's all gonna be really cool stuff. So our whole purpose and goal is to, you know, try to get history into as many hands as possible. So I'll give you a good example. So this is, these are uh, what's called cabs. These, this is a mahogany obsidian. And a lot of people like to do jewelry making. And so these are pre-polished, pre-cut cabs right here where it's flat on the bottom where you can do wire wrap for necklace or jewelry. And we've got mahogany obsidian and all kinds of different different stones. Um, so this is really cool. This is ruby and, and kyanite. That's a beautiful stone. But they're, you know, $8 for a cab. These are $5 for a cab. So they're, they're not an arm and a leg. That is really important to us is that, you know, everybody should be able to afford this stuff. You shouldn't have to be some rich dude on top of a hill in order to own a really cool dinosaur fossil. Everybody should be able to afford this stuff. So we work really hard to make sure that you guys out there of any income level can take something really cool home. So now I want to show you our kind of where we research stuff. So come with me. You guys are really getting to see the behind the scenes. Nobody gets to see this, and I don't think anybody has seen it before. So you guys are really lucky. All right. So back here is our back offices. Um, we've got nearly 20 people on staff. So this is some of the back stock of some of our dinosaur fossils. So they're all wrapped up and ready to go. Giant cave bear limbs, that's all wrapped up and ready to go, ready to go out. Um, back here is, we call this the war room because this is where we work through and process a lot of the actual artifacts. So what we'll do, I'll show you. Um, so there, here's some stuff we're working on, or I was working on yesterday. So uh, I just picked up these, uh, these artifacts. So like this, for example, so this and this, here's another one. This is an antique map. So this is a Revolutionary War era battlefield map. Uh, that was um, that was created in 1807. Uh, it's an original hand-colored map of the American and British positions. Uh, this one is for the Siege of Boston. 
So uh, this was originally commissioned by John Marshall and published by Caleb Wayne, and they created it in 1807, but it's based off of original sketches that were ordered of the battlefield sites that were ordered by George Washington. So in short, this is the very first commercial for the public map of Revolutionary War era battles and positions that were that was created for the American public. And so what we've got to do is, and what I do, spend a lot of my time doing this, is all the research, finding out all that information, finding out who drew it and the whole nine yards, writing that up, and then we'll, we'll once we get them right up, we'll print out a beautiful description that goes with it. Here's another group of stuff that we were working on. These are all Japanese samurai uh, armor pieces right here. So that's a beautiful piece of shin armor. This is a beautiful piece of uh, thigh armor. And so we'll do a big write-up on it here that tells, tells what it is. So uh, this is a beautiful uh, piece of sleeve armor. And so, you know, these all were recent. These all came out of a barn uh, in Japan and were you know, legally imported into the country where we purchased them and we're making up a nice display for them and taking care of them. This is another really neat one and this is actually what I love to do. I love this kind of stuff. So this right here are pages out of a Bible, uh, more than likely a German Bible, uh, but this was found uh, in Europe and the book was so far gone, so far destroyed that only a handful of pages remained. So we picked up these pages, and so now we want to make sure that they are taken care of, that they're preserved, that the information is about it. So this is a, this is a, a Latin Bible, so this is all passages out of the Bible that's written in Latin. So what I've got to do first is, is I've got to translate the Latin, and then once the Latin is translated, then I've got to find what part of the Bible it's out of. And this one I figured out uh, roughly translates to, uh, Hi, rescue me, deliver me from many waters, not yet the children of, uh, of aliens whose uh, mouth has spoken vanity, and the right hand of their heart is forgiveness, and so on and so forth. But basically, it's a passage out of the 144th Psalm, uh, verse uh, 7 through 10. So this is something that, before we got it, was just a beautiful page out of a medieval Bible, but once it comes into our hands, we work really hard to put the information back with it, and that's what sets us apart from everybody else that's in this business. Here's another example of some stuff that we're working on. So all this stuff here, these are all Civil War artifacts that were metal detected by one guy in East Tennessee. So this is all East Tennessee in, so in, in Southern Appalachia during the Civil War. This guy was awesome. What he would do is, is he would draw a map of the area that he was hunting. And for every artifact that he found, he would write the information of where it came from, where it was found, and what position on his map that artifact was from. <clears throat> this guy wrote a book called Campaign to Nowhere. It's a really good book. I'm sure uh, any of y'all from East Tennessee are really familiar with this book. His name was Cleve Smith. Um, he did some great res great research. Um, so what we're doing is, is we're grouping these artifacts back together by their specific position. So this is all from Newmarket and South Hills from position 13 and 13A. So on his map, all of these artifacts were found in a single position, in a single spot. So we'll put all these in a frame. This is same thing, but position 14. All these artifacts from position 14. This is Newmarket and Dandridge Crossroads right here. And so here is a copy of his map of the battlefield that he drew. And in that is position 6 where these artifacts came from. So this artifact came from uh, Newmarket, Dandridge Crossroads, position 6. I cannot express to you how rare it is to have... Uh, a metal detectors take the time to record all of the artifacts that they found. That is something we support, we personally do ourselves, and it is a great practice. So it's our responsibility to do the best that we can to tell that story. Here's an example of, of a group that was done. Um, hold on, where did, oh, I think I laid it, yeah, I laid it right here. Um, 
So when we get finished with it, this is what the frame is going to look like. So this is a group that uh, were part of the winter campaign uh, where the Union and Confederate troops clashed in Dandridge, Tennessee while forging for supplies during the winter of 1863-64. So these artifacts were found on a specific spot that tells a very specific story. In the description, we'll get, we will tell that story. And the story here is this came from a federal picket post at the foot of Bays Mountain Pass from January 1st to 14th. 1864. On January 1st, 1864, the temperatures dropped to 25 degrees below zero. Men on picket burnt saddles, belts, and anything they could to stay warm. Despite this, four men froze to death. And so that is where all of this stuff was found. So what's neat is, is some of the artifacts you can tell were in a fire. So we work really hard to put this information back with it. Uh, another neat thing that we do is, is you know, we make all of this stuff in house. Um, let me show you. Maybe I can show you guys the offices where. Forgive the mess, and I, I know they're not going to be excited about it. But this is this is where Chris Kaufman, who's the manager of the Relic Room, he manages uh, the business for me. Does a fantastic job. He and I have been working together for 20 years. He also, like we all are, is a collector, and he's got his personal collection. Uh, behind him. He collects, uh, that's something that's kind of neat. Those are old uh, uh, old fountain drink cups from the 50s and 60s and 70s and it's just something that you don't that you don't really see very often but you know we, we all we do this because we love this. We all collect. I've got a collection. Everybody here has got a collection. This is Sue Elford. She is our office manager. She keeps track of all of our invoices and everything that we need to keep in track. Hope who and everybody's out sick. They've all got the, the, the bug that's going around. What Hope does is is all those write-ups that I do by hand so she'll take that write-up like this one on Roman arrowheads and she'll write it up to where it looks like this. So this is a spike from the USS Pensacola that's got all the information in it. Um, another important thing for us is a library. Not everything you can, not, you can't research everything on the internet. I know there are young people that think you can, but you can't. Not everything's on the internet. So we rely, I, I use this library probably two, three times a day when I'm doing research. Like here's an example, the samurai stuff that you just saw. So I did some research in a book and to see exactly what the, what the Japanese names for some of that armor was. So this is what the armor is. And here is the Japanese name for it. So, so we use and utilize this library all the time. Um, you know, there's great ones on Civil War buttons and bottles that isn't found on the internet. So we utilize this the library is hugely important to us. This is probably a tenth of the library. The main library is at my house. We've probably got 800,000 books. So here's some of our backstock on some of our stuff. The Megalodon frame that you just saw. So here's more backstock of the Megalodon teeth. And we keep in with it a copy of the write-up so we know what frame it's going to go into. So these will eventually all go to Connie where she'll make it up. These are all juvenile Spinosaurus teeth for a Spinosaurus teeth that we do. So here's the write-up that we do. And these are all Spinosaurus teeth, dinosaur teeth, um, that will go into frames that we create. So we, we, our frames that we create, we create tens of thousands of years. They're in nine different countries and over 20 museums and all over the world. Uh, that's really what we're known for and famous for. Uh, we also have a, uh, have a website, uh, eBay page, Amazon, um, and we do live auctions. So this is our backstock area for our website, Amazon, and eBay page. So this is where we keep everything organized back there. So on our website, here's, uh, here's some dinosaur stuff that we've got on our website. So this is a Triceratops horn that a buddy of mine found uh, about a year ago. So this, you can find this on our website. So the things that are in the showroom, uh, not all of them are on the website because these are one of a kind items. There's only one of that. So, you know, we've got to keep them, keep them separate. Um, we also do live auctions. Um, this is Austin Dalton. Austin takes care of our online sales and everything. Uh, he also helps us on our live auctions. Austin, where can, where, what are the places where people can watch our live auctions? So you can watch our live auctions normally every Tuesday, <coughs> roughly between five and eight o'clock over on Hall's 
uh, group page on Facebook or Cosby Creek Artifacts on our Facebook as well. So just Google those, look those up on Facebook, send us an invite, and we'll uh, let you join. And you can see all the cool stuff that we have there weekly. So I'll show you some stuff that we just put on last week is this stuff. And so what we'll do is, is we've got a, a good friend of ours uh, that runs the auctions, and he'll pick up each individual item, and he'll just talk about it. And all you got to do is comment that you want it, and you get to get it, and we ship it out for you the next day. So here's a pile of stuff that was just bought that is going to go out today. So, yeah. So... So, uh, tell them, uh, we talked earlier, you, you started collecting when you were uh, how old? Oh, man. Uh, so, I grew up on English Mountain in Sevier County, and where I grew up at was the house had an archaic site next to it. So, when we put in a garden every year, we'd plow up arrowheads and stuff. And, you know, when I was about three or four years old, I started picking up arrowheads and collecting them. And then my dad got me a, uh, at seven, he got me a subscription to Central States Archaeological Journal and the Tennessee Archaeological Journal. And so I, when other kids would, you know, nerd out on baseball cards and stuff like that and monster trucks, I was nerding out on archaeology and artifacts and, and history. And I carried that, uh, that card for, my membership card for Central States Archaeological Journal with me in my wallet. I was so proud of that card. I didn't have another thing in my wallet, but dang it, I had a, my membership card to Central <laughs> States. So uh, ever since I was a kid, I've just always involved myself in this. And you travel to, to do this, you're yep. gone for months at a time. So yep. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, three or four times a year, I'll take off for anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months. And I'll go and, and hit, hook up with all of our friends and all these different genres that, you know, dig for this stuff for a living. So I'll either be in, you know, Montana digging for dinosaurs for a couple weeks or a month or, you know, uh, out in Arkansas metal detecting for artifacts, you know, Civil War artifacts, old house sites or bottle digging or whatever for a couple of months. Uh, so I'm all the time on the road and also looking for more stuff for the shop, looking at people's collections or, you know, people's old houses or old barns or we, we just picked up a great collection of artifacts from um, uh, from one of the founding members of the Museum of Appalachia we picked we bought his personal collection and so not only do we have this store here but we also have booths in every antique mall in Sevier County so if you come to Sevierville and do the antique malls that's where a lot of our antiques go we've got big booths in all of those different antique malls just look for the relic room sticker you'll see it's our stuff so I'm all the time on the road going out and and doing this and filming it also so we've got a YouTube channel as well where we like to teach people so uh, we'll show people we'll show you how dinosaurs are found because where can you how do, how do you know how dinosaurs are found well we show you with the people that do it for a living in an interview style much like you're watching here so yeah I spent a lot of time on the road filming and digging and collecting this stuff What's what's the uh, name of the YouTube channel? You call that Chasing History. Chasing History. Okay. Just YouTube Chasing History and check it out. Uh, we've also do a lot of in-house uh, videos as well, where we do short, you know, one minute to ten minute sec segments on either a different type of crystal or a different type of artifact that we'll put on our social media and on our YouTube channel. And that is Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Just look up Smoky Mountain Relic Room. We, we, we're doing so much stuff in so many places. It is insane how much and how many we're doing. So, uh, yeah, we've got, a, <laughs> we're got our hands in a lot of pies. So we had a lot to see today. We did. We just kind of skimmed across everything. I know you said you. you what, what is it you do at your house? You say you restore antiques at your house. Yeah. So ever since. So one of the ways I got started out is, is I used to, you know, when I was a teenager and in my early twenties, I would dig through old barns and pull out antiques and take them and clean them in my shop and restore them. Put them, you know, from wagons to axes, you know, all every, and everything in between. So I still do that. I still love it. So when I'm done with work here. I'll go home and work, you know, for another four, five, six hours, and I'll restore uh, antiques and artifacts and uh, even fossils. I've got a, a nice prep lab uh, that my son, he's 16, and he is a heck of a fossil prepper. I mean, he is really good. And uh, so he'll, me and him will sit there and we'll prep out dinosaur fossils. Because, you know, dinosaur fossils, you don't just boom, there's a bone. That's not how it is. It's boom, there's a bunch of pieces of a bone and you've got to put all those pieces back together. And it is a 3D Tetris puzzle from hell and it is not <laughs> easy putting that together. 
My son's really good at it, and so we do that. At uh, that's what I do at my house. I wish I had it here where it was closer, but you know, we're we're still growing. We're still we're still expanding. Well, maybe uh, we can come over there and make another video at your house one day. Oh, I'd love that. I got a great collection of Appalachian artifacts. So if so you want to see some is neat... Is that your personal stuff? Yeah, or... that's my personal stuff. So are you like uh, Appalachian artifacts? Or what's your favorite yeah. thing? Then? So well, the way I think of all of this stuff, of history and artifacts, is, is no matter how much you pay for it, you don't own it. You don't own it because you're going to die. I'm sorry for the news, but that's going to happen. And it's still going to be here. So this, this thing is still going to be there. So what you're paying for is you're paying for the right to have the responsibility to take care of it. That's what you're paying for. When you're buying something, you are taking on the job of being its caretaker to ensure that it gets from this time right now to the future where hopefully it will still be taken care of where it can do its job and tell the story of the history that it's witnessed. So the history that I have chosen to collect personally is my favorite is Southern Appalachian because I mean my family's been here since 1780. We've looked at those three mountains ever since 1780. You know, we were in the Watauga Association. I mean, we, we've been here forever. I had family who uh, marched to Middlesburg, Kentucky to enlist in the Union Army from Pigeon Forge. So, I mean, that's my that's my history. So that's the kind of stuff that I collect is, is primitive folk art, Southern Appalachian, East Tennessee stuff. So, and anything that I see that's kind of really important, that really needs an extra level of care, so I'll, I want to make sure I get it because I know I'll do a really good job of making sure that that makes it the next 50 years. And hopefully when I get time to die, you know, my son will want to take care of it. And if he doesn't, I'll find people that will want to continue to take care of this stuff. Because, you know, the question is, is why isn't all of this stuff in museums? Well, the truth is, is that there's not enough room in all the museums in all the world to hold everything humanity has ever made. There isn't. To give an example, the state paleontologist for the state of Utah said that the state of Utah will never dig another sauropod, another dinosaur. They will never do it, never dig another type of this dinosaur because they have so many. Museums don't have the room. So it's up to us as individuals, as human beings, to take care of not only human history, but the Earth's history as well. And that's one of the things that we try to get across to people is, is the sense of that responsibility and that job, and hopefully inspire some people to do that. Because that's how we learn about the past, is through objects. I can tell you everything I can about the Civil War, but you know when I hold up a gun from the Civil War and I hand it to you, you understand that history a little better, and that's the job of artifacts. That's the job of things, is to add a tactile and a visual sense so that we can understand the story of the history that, that, that it witnessed, so hopefully it can never be repeated. So we're trying to do some, it's, we're not just here buying and selling stuff. We're, we're actually trying to, to make a difference and, and to start, you know, to you know, improve this, collect, this hobby and this idea of collecting and taking care of history and hopefully, you know, getting people excited about history. Because, I mean, as you know, if, you know, history, what, what's the thing they always say? History is always doomed to repeat it. That's because nobody goes back and reads history. So our idea is that we can get artifacts into people's hands. It'll give people an excuse to learn about history and hopefully make the world a better place. Well, I'll have to say you're probably the most uh, passionate person I've ever interviewed about your, <laughs> what you do. It's not just a job to you. It's a uh, no. it's uh, it's just what you uh, get up every morning and think about, I bet. You, oh, bet you go to bed at night thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I absolutely love doing this. I mean, how can you not? I mean, I just <laughs> held up a triceratops horn and showed it to you, and I get to do that every day? Dude, that's awesome. Man, how can you not be excited about that? So, yeah, I, I, I love doing it, and what's really cool is is the you know the people that work with us here at the relic room we're, we all have that passion we all have that sense of vision and what we're trying to do and you know we're all in it together and we have the same love for this stuff you know it, it's it's really cool we've got a really good team of people here so the only thing we need is is for you guys to come check us out and to tell people that we exist because we got a really cool thing going on here well i did a, i did a video about a year ago of the knife works upstairs yep. uh, and your dad started that in the early 70s we actually yep. started the relic room first yep. you started selling artifacts and then got into knives yep. and kind of shelved 
you said put the relic room beside. Then you yep. came along. I guess what you revive it because of well, your so so what ha so the knife works actually got started out of the relic room. The relic room had a catalog, and in that relic room catalog, uh, Dad put a page of knives in, and the knives did better than the artifacts did. So he put the artifact business, the relic room aside, and uh, did the uh, knife business, and that's where the knife works came from. So when we added on to our store, we added on uh, we doubled the size of our store. And when we did that, we wanted to put in a little section of just maybe a few arrowheads and some Civil War antiques and that's it. Well, around that time, I had gotten out of college and I really wanted to do something involved in history. So I asked if I could take over that little section and have this space and build something, you know, where people can come and buy history. And so that's what we did. And that's what I did. And just over the past 20 years, the Relic Room has grown into what it is, what it is today. But yeah, and then a few years ago, I purchased the business from dad. And so it's, it's, it's all it's all on me now. So if the ship if the ship sinks, it's my fault. <laughs> well, I think you got it under control. It looks like things are going pretty good for you, and that uh, uh, you've got an amazing collection here. And it's something that uh, it's right off Interstate uh, 40. Yep. Uh, you're seven eight miles off there, so five minutes. Uh, even if you don't want to go all the way into the busy part of Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg, you can get here real easy right oh, off yeah. Interstate 40. So if you're traveling, stop by. You can spend hours and hours here. How many square foot is everything? Do you know? 110,000 square feet. 110,000 square feet. And it's like a museum. We didn't go through the knife part, but that's <coughs> on another video. You can see it on the, our channel there. Just uh, search Smoky Mountain Knife Works and you'll find it. But uh, we started with uh, that about a year ago, showing all the knife uh, part. Then got to come back and see you so yeah been an amazing tour well i appreciate you guys coming in to see us thank you so much and i appreciate you guys out there watching thank you guys so much for what for what you do so you know hopefully you guys will come see us and if you do let us know where you saw us all right see y'all next time guys Bye -bye. history rocks Woo <laughs>